Uh, hey everyone, uh, welcome back to another episode of Tech Talks with Santosh. And today we have a very special guest. I think I uh, mentioned on Twitter that uh, uh, he has been like a programmer for more than three decades now. He started his career way back in 1983. So uh, welcome to the show, uh, Sanjay Vassar. Thank you. Sir. Thank you so much. Uh, so let me just introduce uh, Sanjay Vassar. So he's, uh, he started working at, in IT from 1983. And he started as a mainframe and COBOL programmer and uh, then shifted to Unix and C in 86. He wrote an antivirus for Cbrain in 1987. He, uh, he started then, he moved to Windows way back in 1990. I'm sure we were kids back then. And then he founded a company uh, called Synergetics in 1993, which he owned till 2009. And he's also a MS certified trainer partner in India uh, on Vision Studio, MFC and SDK. He has trained internationally for last 20 years, which is more than two decades. And he's uh, uh, he has been MVP for multiple times. He introduced .NET to India in 2001 uh, when I was in school. And uh, he, uh, he has also been speaking at MS events since 1986, which includes TechEd, DevTales, PDC. And he became Microsoft Regional Director in 2016. I know there are a lot of amazing uh, people who actually is Microsoft Regional Director from the world, and he's the one. And he's also an architect, architect design and develop implemented NHI Toll Plaza project uh, using Linux and Java. He is now semi-retired, spends time coaching college kids as well as in CDAC. And he also uh, works as a technical consultant right now, technical architect uh, with few clients, which he has. And yes, that's, that's about him. So uh, we are looking forward to this session. And, we will explore more on visual learning. So I came to know Sanjay Vassar by his tweets, he which he used to share, and uh, his post on LinkedIn. He uh, there was really interesting called visual learning, and then I thought of having him on the show one day. And yeah, we are we are lucky we got him. Thanks a lot, sir. Thanks, my pleasure. So hi guys, uh, I'm not going to take too much time talking about it. We'll. Straight away, go into visuals and into code. I hope uh, you follow me on that. Uh, but there's only one question that I would like to start with. Uh, mm -hmm. When you meet someone after a long time, maybe from school or you know your childhood, you immediately. I, got I think you. I think you. Mm -hmm. Sorry, uh, there was some. There was some. Yeah. Uh, I cannot hear you. Uh, I cannot hear you. Uh, no, I think there is some problem. I think there is we cannot problem. hear. We I can just hear myself. Mm -hmm. Nope, still no. Uh, you are on mute. I think you are on mute. It so shows you are on mute. Uh, yeah. Can yeah. You hear yeah. Oh, so so sorry about this. I thought we were talking and uh, I was on on this. So when we meet somebody after a long time, maybe from childhood or friend, we immediately say, hey, I remember your face. Oh, sorry, remember your name, but I've forgotten your face. Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. It actually happens the other way. We remember faces, but we forget names. And that is the core of visual learning. I mean, uh, one thing that I've been researching for about 30 years now is how the brain learns, how it absorbs information and how it remembers and recollects. Mm -hmm. It's purely visual. Okay. So I have been actually uh, teaching for all these years using a methodology which is known as concept visualization. Mm -hmm. What it basically does is it takes any piece of information and step by step convert it into a series of visuals mm -hmm. and present it to people. Now, what happens in this case is the brain absorbs those visuals much better than words. So this is what I've been doing now. Unfortunately, because of this lockdown and COVID, I could not go out and draw these visuals and 
Uh, again, you you went on mute. I think. Ah, uh, you are on. Yeah. Ah, uh, sir, is that? Ah, uh, you are on mute again. Ah, uh, sorry. Ah, uh, again. So, ah, uh, you are still on mute. Mm -hmm. Just a second. Uh, sorry, sir, you are on mute. Somehow, uh, I can see you are on mute. I am so, yeah. quite a lot for being a 30 year old technologist. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. I think you were uh, somewhere between uh, the COVID, right? So uh, yeah. that's what so, we had. So um, I used to draw on whiteboard. I used to, for almost 30 years, I was drawing. Uh, mm -hmm technology on whiteboard and teaching that way. And then with COVID, uh, suddenly I had to use computer to teach. So I figured out uh, which tools to use. Uh, mm -hmm. How can I express the same things? So that itself is a vast topic, how the human brain learns. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've just you know, given a few key points saying it it works better with visuals than it does with uh, text. Mm -hmm. And with concept visualization and our digital concept visualization basically takes text, converts it into visual, feeds it to our brain so that our brain remembers it and understands it better. So let me not talk too much, but instead get into some demos. So mm -hmm. what I'm going to do is show some examples of these concept visuals, okay. what they can look like, and uh, maybe then translate it into some bit of code to see what how to, how to do that. So mm -hmm. let me share yeah. my application window here. Yeah. So. Yeah, let me just start I the hope. stream. Ah, uh, yeah, we can see now. All right. So this is a session that I do, which is called digital concept visualization, compilation mm -hmm. process, and process map. Uh, this is the part which is used for converting text into diagram, and it's a science by itself. And there are rules which you can follow and do it kind of automatically. But the topic that I'm going to take is compilation process and process map. I'm assuming that the audience here would be mostly from IT or developer background. And uh, in this last 36 years that I've been in this field, I've realized one thing, that uh, the easiest and the best way to learn a technology or platform is to understand its process map. So let me start off. Uh, this is something that we, could, we would have learned in our college time uh early on in our career that to write a program and run it we need to write some sort of source code yes uh, this is what comes from languages this is probably c so there is mm -hmm. a piece of c code which we compile mm -hmm. now see these are the things that we read from books and we sit through lectures and the professor also tells us but mm -hmm. uh here, the focus is not on the text of the professor, but the diagram, which I've been shown. Mm -hmm. And this is concept visualization. So when you compile this code, it produces binary. And this is referred to as object code. But this is not complete because we are using some functions ourselves, which we have not written. We need to include this from somewhere. Mm -hmm. And that comes from something called the library. So library is nothing but a collection of previously compiled code sitting somewhere in some file. So we need something called linker. Now this linker basically takes what we have written, what mm -hmm. we have used, combines the two, and produces what is finally the executable. Okay. Technically, this is a program. This is source code. 
but that's okay people when they say i'm writing a program they basically mean they're writing a source code for something that they will compile and produce program out of now this is just uh, one half of the story this is the process in which we can convert source code from probably any programming language into some executable code but what happens after this is far more interesting mm -hmm. this pro program has to be brought into the memory to execute and we know it by various terms run the program launch the program execute the programs and so on and once the program uh, reaches here this is what it becomes a process and this is where it gets interesting because a process mm -hmm. is not a monolithic solid piece of thing it's actually mm -hmm. broken down and structured very well in fact there are different areas of this process which do different things and therefore it is also referred to as the process map now process map is basically this process broken down into what is known as different segments or sections so remember this piece of code remember mm -hmm. the library they arrive uh, in something called a code segment the loader picks it up stores it in a different segment mm -hmm. the data arrives uh, which is the global data arrives in two different segments called bss and data they are segregated based on their initial value whether it was zero or non zero okay. nothing great about this and then we have uh, stack now stack is a place where whenever the program executes it stores its local data these days i see people call it as uh, function context mm -hmm. but uh, we oldies have known this as a stack frame so whenever a function runs it actually receives or creates what is known as a stack frame mm -hmm. this stack frame actually contains four main components starting with the return address where it's supposed to go back formal parameters what it receives when mm -hmm. it is called a set of local variables that it's creating and a return value that it's going to give back now interesting thing is today most languages are stack based languages mm -hmm. so almost all languages will have these four components a return address uh, arguments or parameters that are passed set of local variables and return value so when we call different functions so in case main calls printf every mm -hmm. time that happens it creates its own stack frame and every time the printf function returns the stack frame would be destroyed now see the point that i'm trying to make here is i i'm not i'm not showing anything which is new or something that people don't know but mm -hmm. the brain is wired to follow visuals and what i'm doing is i'm presenting the same information again through the visual route so that whatever we know we start mapping it saying oh this is where it goes oh this is what the mm -hmm. stack looks like that looks like is a very important aspect in learning new technology because if we can see what it looks like we can control it we can use it we can program it trouble is when we are only reading syntax and then we just try to figure out somehow oh this is what it must be do no moving from what is this must be to what this looks like makes a huge difference the way we program the way we you know solve problems okay so are there any questions in between that you would like to ask before we continue um, as of now we don't have any questions i think we can continue i mean i'm all also right. enjoying it all right and this brings us to the most important aspect of a process map which is the heap now this is mm -hmm. like a 
empty warehouse where you can go and you know borrow some space for some time so imagine a warehouse where goods arrive they are stored for some time and then they are taken off taken away the place is reused more goods arrive so a heap is like a warehouse where data keeps arriving place is being reserved for a while then it's taken off gone away someone else uses it different languages use this heap in different ways especially static languages use it differently and dynamic mm -hmm. languages use it differently now we'll take a look at uh, one of the dynamic languages let's say javascript uh, how it differs in the way it uses the same heap and this is probably true for let's say c c++ mm -hmm. so a typical c c++ program when it's loaded into memory the process is divided in this process map i'm not saying these are the only segments i'm showing the most important ones the code data bases stack and heap mm -hmm. so this empty warehouse which uh, it starts with right at the beginning it starts empty but then mm -hmm. as the program continues you can allocate memory in the oh. heap so you can go up to the warehouse and you tell the guy they are saying hey give me some space for a day because i've got some goods to keep this process uh, is called malloc or calloc in c but most other languages call it new whether it's java or c sharp or c++ even javascript whenever mm -hmm. we say new this is where the data is going oh. and whenever we say let or var the data is going probably here okay so that's the difference between local variables and heap allocated data so this is an example of visual learning because we are revisiting the name the concept that we have known but mm -hmm. now we are putting it in visual saying oh this is what it looks like so this is what really happens this makes us better developer this makes us understand programming a bit better mm -hmm. now this is just an example of visual learning now i i can show you some example of how things work uh, let's say in a multi threaded environment when we are using a monitor mm -hmm. so this is a process of if we write c sharp code which is like this i'm not going into the code but how we would use any given object mm -hmm. for locking so what really happens in memory and how that simple ob c sharp object is used as multi link lock where we can make sure that these three functions cannot be used simultaneously so these are all examples of of that but i would like to go into javascript for a couple of reasons one it's pretty popular these days yep. two it's very different from the traditional static languages so let me open up uh, another diagram for javascript mm -hmm. where we'll take a look at how javascript differs mm -hmm. from static languages so here is static language this is something that we just saw a little while ago very fixed very predetermined everything must have a place everything should go into its place code mm -hmm. data bss javascript on the other hand is completely different the way it approaches the whole process map is diametrically opposite it says i don't need all those guys just give mm -hmm. me the heap okay so we'll we'll take a look at uh, javascript process map as well well every process that is every program that you run 
must have a process map. Mm -hmm. But how that process map is being used is dependent on that language or platform. And in JavaScript, we have no pre-compiled code because it's a dynamic language, scripted language. You just write a piece of code and start running it. So there is no binary code, unlike this case where we had binary code. Right. So instead, this code segment is occupied by the JavaScript engine itself. So here is where the JavaScript engine establishes itself. Now. It has various components like memory management, interpreter, byte converter, garbage collector, and more. Oh. I'm not going giving specific name because there are multiple engines like Thanks. Chakra, Spider Monkey, uh, JavaScript V8. Core, V8. Yeah. I was coming to that last because that's the one which is most popular. So everyone uh, kind of. Uh, uses V8 references of you know yeah. ignition and crankshaft earlier, turbo fan and blah. I'm just giving them generic names, saying any JavaScript engine of worth its salt would have some of these components which will do memory management, interpret the code, convert to byte code either mm -hmm. just in time or you know compile before and AOT. garbage character. So this is process map, but it's looking different. So we do have a global area, but it mm -hmm. doesn't uh, behave like the global area that uh, a typical C, C++ kind of uh, process map would have. So let's mm -hmm. take a look at a very simple code. And let's assume that I'm running this in uh, Node.js environment. So here is my process map, and here is the code. Mm -hmm. Now. Why I keep saying visual learning is important because typically a developer would start and he would, you know, start reading this code and try to understand. And someone will come and say, "Oh, this is a variable. This is also a variable." But sometimes we don't put var. It's okay. It's slow. no. Visual learning is whatever we are reading, whether it's code or it's text. It's some. Um, blog that we are reading or some technical book we are reading, our brain is going to block it. What we have to do is feed the brain these visuals. So I have this saying, which I say in my class regularly. Visuals are chocolates for your brain. It loves them. Feed visuals as much as you want. And brain will never tire of that. To give you an example, how long can you read a book? Even if you're interested in that, maybe it's a novel that you love, you can't read it eight hours at a stretch. If I make that a you know nonfiction textbook, I mm -hmm. doubt if people can even read a technical book for an hour without putting it down. Mm -hmm. Of course they can't. But when did this happen to you last time that while walking through the day, going about it, you suddenly put your hand on your eyes and say, I can't see it anymore. I've seen too much for today. It doesn't happen. Brain can keep receiving visual input for hours at end, but it can't keep up with text. Uh, as I said, concept visualization is a science that I've created. I have a lot of proof that I can give. But maybe today's limited time, I can't go more deep in that. But I can show you examples of that. Mm -hmm. So looking at this code, anyone who is a JavaScript programmer knows what the right side is. I want to show them what the left side. Mm -hmm. So when you come across a statement like this, what really happens is JavaScript creates a global or window pointer. Now, let's understand this. The computer says, you have to tell me everything in advance so that I can keep them in code, data, BSS, or stack. I can arrange mm -hmm. for it. JavaScript says, hey, I don't know anything. When I read the code, I'll let you know. He says, that's too late. You go to the warehouse. That's the only place 
were at run time i can give you some memory mm-hmm. so javascript is very heap centric when you execute a statement like this it basically creates what is known as a dictionary hash table hash map so this dictionary and i often joke with my students saying brendan i creator of javascript mm-hmm. probably was taught only dictionary <laughs> during this college <laughs> you know the truth is that uh, he had to rely on dictionary all the time because mm-hmm. in javascript everything is coming at run time and you don't know whether when that variable will pop up when that function will get defined so when you look at this process map you will figure out that everything is inside the heap there is no global data being stored here in fact if you do have global they will also go to dictionary they will also go into heap so when you define mm-hmm. something like this this is what it does it puts this global variable into a global dictionary and the value that we are giving also goes to the heap similarly if there are any local variables and in case of node these are not global these are local it uses the stack so it creates what is known as the stack frame that's a universal reality of most languages today all of mm-hmm. them are stack based so in this case an anonymous stack frame is created and these variables would also go here but unfortunately it could not provide the you know cpu or the loader enough information about which variables would be there when the program runs so he says off you go to the heap and that's what happens it creates another dictionary mm-hmm. which is called local which is kept in the heap so nothing actually goes in here and nothing actually goes in here if you look at this it's the exact opposite opposite almost everything goes in here or here mm-hmm. and occasionally things go here when you say new but in case of javascript not just new everything goes there even your local variables your global variables your classes the functions your uh, objects that you create everything is just pushed into the heap so when you do this you realize that x actually goes into the heap and so does y now all these guys they are not really variables they appear as variables to us but in memory they are merely keys into some hash table the javascript engine is created they are all simple strings stored as keys somewhere in the heap now this we can still understand and i say we because i come from slightly older generation that yeah we store data sometimes in the heap so yeah it's okay understand it but not with javascript Mm-hmm. in case of javascript even this is stored as oh. a string somewhere in memory heap memory you would expect that this is a function it will go somewhere on its own area some some part of this process map nope for javascript everything is data even function is data global data variables are data everything is data and all the data has to be stuffed into heap now when i'm learning c and when i'm learning c++ the syntax is not very different i mean i can write this in c i'll say int add int a comma int b and probably the code would look very similar mm-hmm. i would have some global variables defined outside main calling of the function is the same but through visual learning we realize that the whole process is completely different how a static language like c c++ or maybe even java or c sharp works versus how a dynamic language like javascript or python 
the syntax may look the same or similar. But everything is different in Mali. Now, this is where things go wrong. When I come from an existing language into another, mm -hmm. I bring my understanding of that language and I try to fit here. And I've seen this happen a lot of times. A lot of C sharp programmers got into JavaScript and they said, hey, this looks very similar. <laughs> oh, I know this. I know how this works. Yeah. And things start going wrong because they say, no, but there it works differently. How come this is not working here? So there is a period of struggle and there is, you know, learning by mistake saying, no, they're different. With visual learning, what we can do is cut down that time, more than that time. Take all the time you want. But building that understanding of, of our technology, that C, C++ works differently. JavaScript right. works differently. The syntax may look similar or same. I mean, if I write class X extends Y, braces, you can't say whether C, or C, sorry, JavaScript or Java. The same syntax works in both languages, identical. But what happens in memory is completely different. So we go ahead with this and you know look at uh, how a function gets called. And uh, this is again a universal reality in all programming languages which are based on stack. That whenever a function is called, a stack frame has to be created. Mm -hmm. But unlike the previous one where there is a lot of data which is stored inside stack like C, C++, Java, C sharp. Mm -hmm. Almost nothing gets stored here except maybe a pointer, which points to mm -hmm. another dictionary. This is known as local. So you get more dictionaries in the heap. Now all variables coming out of here would be stored in their dictionaries. So C will get defined here. You see this. This is going here. Uh, A and B would oh. also go here. So everything is just about everything in JavaScript is stuffed into the heap. Let me rapidly switch between the two. Nothing in heap, everything in heap. Nothing nothing as in this one loan malloc. Yeah. Here, by default, everything in heap. Here, by choice, you would use the heap. Here, you have no choice. Mm -hmm. Nothing in heap, everything in heap. Similar looking syntax, similar looking language. Completely different behavior. So now let me uh, start this off. Uh, how do we understand? How do we, you know, realize these things? Well, mm -hmm. I am not a friend with Brendan Ike. I would love to be. But I'm friend with the debugger. Mm -hmm. Now sometimes, many a time, there are things right in front of our eyes. We see them, but we don't analyze them. We just accept them as they are and they just... Go ahead. So let me share. I, mean, I need to stop this share to start another one. All right. Mm -hmm. So let me share another window. This time, Visual Studio Code. OK. And we are going to write exactly the same program that we saw there and see what happens in memory. So I am going to call it simple.js and I'm going to write that same code g is equal to 10 let's increase the font var x equal to 5 var y equal to 7 write the add function so I'm going to say function add a and b create a var c where I'll say this is a local variable return mm -hmm. 
C equal to A plus B return C. Now see what is happening is when I'm writing this code in JavaScript, my mind is visualizing something different. If I write similar code in C language, my mind would visualize something completely different saying, oh, this is going into the stack frame. This is going into the heap. That helps me in understanding what I'm doing, what is happening in memory. And uh, here I'm going to say const result is equal to add a comma b. Now, world over programming is taught like this, which I think is the wrong way to introduce programming. Mm -hmm. That the correct so way would... line but fill. Oh yeah, thank you. So I'm going to say x comma y, and I'm going to print mm -hmm. that result here. First, we'll run this program. See the output should be 12. Nothing mm -hmm. great in this. But this is not what I want to show you. This is not what what, what I show uh, my students. Mm -hmm. I say let's visualize what is happening inside and. I also say this, I never teach my opinions. Debugger is my friend. So I'm mm -hmm. going to debug this. So run, 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 run to the debugger. And when I step through these, I would actually, oh, it kind of didn't. So let me stop this. Oh, my debugger is. Kind of hung. Oh. <laughs> Years of debugging and this happens when you do a demo. <laughs> so. Uh, let me. Do a shift F5, no, completely hung. Mm -hmm. No problem. The best part of VGS code is starts in three seconds. I love <laughs> that about it. So I'm going to go back here, share it, uh, go back to my share screen, and pick up this. So you're back here. So I'm going to open up uh, my app. No, <laughs> I don't know where it got. Oh, it's here. It's here. Yeah, it's already there. So I'm going to put up a breakpoint, uh, run this. I hope, it, let me open a folder because we'll try to create VS code file. So I'm going to open a folder in my, somewhere here. Uh, oh, let me call it demo. Mm -hmm. Wrong spelling, but that's okay. And I'm going to create the same simple.js. Oops. And put that code here. Hopefully, mm -hmm. the debugger will run now. I didn't have a folder open. There we go. Yeah. Now, I, as I said, I don't teach my opinion. I'm very good friends with the debugger. And I usually step through every single thing in the debugger. So I can see here, this is the global dictionary and this is the local dictionary. These are the two things that we were looking at in the process. Mm -hmm. One global dictionary coming from top and the local dictionary right. coming from the bottom. And both these dictionaries are in the heap and everything goes in there. Now this is where I find things out. This is where I learn to visualize. Visual learning is not does not happen in empty space or world. Mm -hmm. I'm not manufacturing things. I'm getting them from somewhere, mostly from official documentation, but more so from the debugger because it tells me what exactly is going on in memory. So this is a hash table or a map or what mm -hmm. JavaScript calls as a dictionary. This is one dictionary. This is another. When I step through, I can see that it has created dynamically a variable in the global dictionary. So you can see it here. It's not in the local. It's not in the local. There are X and Y in the local, but this being a global has gone to a different dictionary. Mm -hmm. 
And when I step through these, I can see that these variables are being defined. This is a difference. And this is a key value pair. So everything is a key, and even your variables are keys. And uh, we can even see the stack frame. So we can see that dynamically a stack frame has been created. And each stack frame has its own local dictionary. So this is local dictionary of add, and this is local dictionary of the anonymous. And I can switch between these two and see those dictionaries. Global, of course, remains the same. Regardless of where we are, we will continue mm -hmm. to see G10. So I run this, it returns the value, prints it. We are back to a single stack frame. The other one has been destroyed. Now, let's go back to what we were doing in terms of the visual learning. So I'll go back to my thing here. This comes to me later. This comes to me first. Mm -hmm. For most people, it's just the right part. So they just learn the syntax. Now, how people get better at programming is that they learn a language by syntax and they start right. recognizing patterns. So they say, oh, do this and that will happen. Or do this and this will happen. So don't do it. Brain has very limited capacity for storing all these permutation and combination of patterns. For me, learning starts from the left side. I must understand the process map. I must understand how it's laid out, what is happening there. Then I come to the right side and say, oh, so when I do this, this is what would happen. This is where it would go. No, no, that's not a good thing. Uh, so sometimes I'm surprised. Uh, even after years, people still don't really understand the pro language or platform they are working on. So I come across a guy, maybe who's working on JavaScript for three years, but if you ask him a bit about function, he, does, he doesn't know what really happens. Let me show you quickly what happens when a function is defined in JavaScript. And this may be mm -hmm. you know, interesting to many JavaScript programmers themselves. So let me start off with a piece of code, which is like this. Nothing complicated, pretty simple, straightforward. I'm defining a function, and I'm defining an object based on that function. So this is a constructor function. Mm -hmm. This is what JavaScript started off with. But later, they added classes, which are fraud. There are no classes in JavaScript. Yeah, okay. JavaScript is not a class-based or object-oriented language. It's a prototype-based. Yeah. Everything is an object. Mm -hmm. But people don't understand what happens here. They, they think only this is an object. They think when mm -hmm. you create an object mm -hmm. is when you get an object. They don't realize that this is also an object. Mm -hmm. And now they on top of this, they have some pattern saying, oh, if you want to share variables, you must say employee.prototype is equal to something. But these are patterns. Visual learning says, OK, let's take a look at, first of all, what is employee. This name is nothing but a key in some dictionary somewhere. Right. When you create this, when you go through this function as in JavaScript engine, it actually creates an object. So. Employee is not only a function. Employee itself is an object. Because uh, J JavaScript is not class-based, so it doesn't create classes like C++ or Java. It straight away creates objects. Now, it's very interesting how this works. And uh, again, this is something that people are forever confused between. And I blame Brendan Ike for this. He chose two very similar names uh to mean two different things one is called the proto and the other is called the prototype mm -hmm. 
nine out of ten JavaScript programmers who learn by patterns or learn by syntax or learn only by reading, they say, ah, but proto prototype. They think it's similar. One and the same thing. <laughs> Not just similar. They think it's the same thing. Yeah. So uh, when we start looking at it visually, we learn, we start to understand all the key components here. So when I write this function employee, the code of it is picked up and stashed away somewhere. This whole code, this entire code. But before mm -hmm. that, it creates an object. Now, when I go here, I see that employee.count is going in this. And it's creating a twin object called prototype. This is prototype. This is not proto. And prototype points back to that object as constructor. Now, when we create the object Ike, which is here, we can see that this object also has a proto. In fact, all of them have a proto. And proto here mm. loosely means father, but prototype would then mean husband. So mixing proto and prototype is like not knowing the difference between husband and father. Yeah, both are male. But they are two different people doing two different things. So the fun returns back to learning because your brain sees this and then understands this. And this is what I really mean by visual learning. The best part is everybody's brain is visual. But they have been struggling with text. If if they are brought to the visual side, then they would suddenly start understanding a whole lot better. They would start understanding much faster. They would be able to develop, I mean, program code better rather than struggle every day on basis of syntax and patterns. So this was a kind of a short uh, intro mm -hmm. to what visual learning is, how we can incorporate it. Uh, but as I said, it's deeper science. How do you take any piece of technical text and uh, convert it in series of visual? Uh, let me not make outlandish claims. Mm -hmm. But yes, people who do these visual learning have been able to learn a language in less than a week. And I'm not just saying learn by syntax they could mm -hmm. actually start programming less than a week because they could visualize everything they just mapped the syntax to what is happening in the language so imagine that process so i think that's all the time we have and uh, i hope i've not overrun the time too much i don't know we all yeah. we have all, i mean all the time in the world so i don't care <laughs> if it goes above uh, what we have uh, so no i know really you have given me uh, 45 <laughs> minutes and I generally am uh -huh. very punctual about it. Uh, I mean, uh, of course, I have to take care uh, of the guests as well, right? So that's why I keep it 45 minutes. But uh, in case uh, you have more to share, I mean, we can have another session probably uh, in sure. a month or two. So I can sure. invite you again. That was really interesting because I can understand. Uh, I think uh, the visual learning which uh, will help me more in is like understanding the compilers, right? Now, nowadays, you have Webpack, Webbel. And if I understand this, the constructs of uh, programming language better, I think I will be able to crack those parts easier. That's uh, true, one thing. true, right? Everything, and I'm not restricting it just to the compilers. I'm saying everything you can learn visually, just about everything. Yeah. So I've learned music visually. I've learned programming visually. Uh, somehow, right from the beginning, I, I learned to mm -hmm. see things rather than read them. Uh, so. Um, I, I know about uh, 15 to 16 languages, and I'm not saying that proudly. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't feel proud that I know languages. I feel proud that I can visualize all those languages. Uh -huh. So I, I'm equally comfortable in JavaScript, Python, C++, C Sharp, or whatever. So I've kind uh -huh. of freed myself from the you know syntax of things yeah. and uh, learned more on the visual aspect. I think, yeah, that's that's important to understand. Uh, if you once go above the syntax, you will start understanding the constructs. I think uh, technol uh, technology or programming language doesn't matter. 
No, if you know doesn't. about how actually, uh, let's say, interceptors work, right? So interceptors oh. actually work similar everywhere you go. Maybe you write it cool. in a, a different syntax. That is yeah. true. That is true. Cool. All right. So I so, hope uh, the session was useful. And uh, if there yeah, any I think... feedback, I would love to get that. I think there is a question from Vijay. So sure. he says, can you explain how does the scope chain augmentation happens if uh, everything is stored in here? Uh, I'm assuming he's uh, speaking and talking about JavaScript. Uh, I haven't really come across this term so very often. Yeah. Uh, are people allowed to uh, give audio input and can I interact uh, I with them or is it? Uh, actually, they are on YouTube, so yes, I mean, they, uh, if Vijay, you can, uh, if you want to simplify this question, probably. Hey, La hey Lars. I mean, uh, probably he's asking for something like uh, we do uh, do the function chaining, right? So let's say uh, add dot, then if we call add, then function dot subtract dot, then another oh. function. All right, all right. Uh, so what's the problem if it is in the heap? All the functions are stored in the heap. All the function objects are stored in the heap. All the invocation, even though you have a stack frame which is created, all the local variables are created in the heap. I wish I could draw the diagram mm -hmm. and show it to him whether it's you know prototype chaining or scope chaining. But uh, it's difficult to explain without me drawing that diagram. So maybe hey, find me. Uh, you know, I'm there on Telegram. So. Look me mm -hmm. up and uh, have a one on one, and I'll be glad to draw those diagrams and show it to you how it works. Ah, that's that's cool. So, Vijay, I, I can share the details. Uh, I think you can follow him uh, on Twitter as well and probably DM him uh, in case you want to get in touch. And uh, uh, that's I, I have I've seen he is very active on Telegram, so you can always get in touch there as well. OK, so coming to I think this question relates to the next question which we have, where the people can learn about this visual learning. All right, so what would you suggest if someone is starting new with this method? Yeah. Uh, I have a very simple advice. It works magically, but uh, 9 out of 10 people don't uh, use it, don't follow it. And the advice is if you're reading without drawing, you're wasting your time. I never ever read and just read. Whenever I'm, I sit down to read something, a new technology, a new language, I keep a you know heap of paper, or should I say stack of paper, I, and uh, I keep a pencil and an eraser, and I whatever I'm learning, I doodle it, I draw it, saying, oh, so this is source, okay, this goes here, and now where is this going? Okay, let me draw that here, and then connect it from this to this, and this returns back, and at the end of that I realize I have a visual diagram which is actually telling me how that thing mm -hmm. works. So if you are new to this, just follow a simple advice: never read without drawing. You are wasting your time. Doodle, whatever comes to your mind. There's a science mm -hmm. to it, and if you happen to uh, attend one of the sessions, I can explain that science. But even in absence of science, the minimum you can do, just do it. Mm -hmm. That's good. Uh, OK, so we have one question from Lars. I think uh, let's take, uh, yeah. how do you apply visual learning to blog posts? Oh, I'm assuming that uh, the question is, can I make my blog post more visual? Or See, the human brain always attaches to visuals first. It, it never starts reading text. So if I show you any web page, and if there's a visual, your eye will automatically go to the visual first and then start reading it or start analyzing it. Now, if you want a great post, the entire flow of your post should be a series of images which tell you what to expect from the next paragraph or what is going to happen in the code below. So not that I'm a great blogger uh, somehow i can't write uh, very well but uh, you you can actually capture the user's attention and direct it based on strategically placed 
visuals, which not only show visual, but actually take him through the flow. And that would be a great way to create blog posts. I never read blog posts which have no visuals. Mm-hmm. Cool. Yep. Uh, so Vijay is saying very insightful. Thank you. And You're Guru welcome. is saying it's an interesting topic. And oh, yes, it is. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, I, I saw your uh, tweet once, sir. So you said uh, in case someone is interested to join your session, they can join at such a uh, I mean, you shared some links as well. So in case someone wants to actually join your session, where they can reach out to you? Uh, it's a very simple link. It's a telegram mm-hmm. link. Okay. And it's an abbreviation of Sanjay Vyas Technology Workshop. So S V okay. T W. And uh, because so it's a it... telegram link, T dot me. Uh-huh. Okay. So T dot so... me slash S V T W. S V T W. Okay, so I'll just share it here in case someone wants to. Uh, okay, it, it uh, somehow it sent me on telegram.org. Yes, it would. T.me okay. slash SVTW will take you to Telegram, will take you to the group, in fact. And you can just join the group, and uh, I do a lot, my, a lot of my sessions there, discussions there. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. So I'll just add that into uh, the description and uh, you can join that telegram uh, link. And whenever there is a new session, I think that will be announced in the group itself and you can always join. And uh, Nas, I, I like the two style. I, I like your style, actually. He says, uh, no visual is supposed to no read. End of discussion. Yeah, agreed. I mean, uh, that's, what, that's, that's, uh, that's why actually I, I, a lot of... I'm, I'm yeah. not sure if he's talking about my... Present my personal style, <laughs> or he's talking about the uh, presentation style. But I don't know. Either, either way, thank you so much. <laughs> uh, yeah. So Aram can say is awesome old man, but your skills are still young. I think yeah, that's that skill everyone wants to learn. <laughs> yeah. Somebody asked me, uh, "What are you?" I said, "I'm a programmer." He said, oh, "You you're too old for a programmer." I said, "What is that?" I mean, uh-huh. programmer is always a programmer. So. Um, I still consider myself primarily as a programmer who can solve things visualizing. Oh, thank you for saying awesome old man. <laughs> and last is both, of course, your style as well as uh, this comment. So, yep. Uh, thank you, Lars. <laughs> thank you. Yes. So, yep. I mean, I'll, I'll be sharing the link. And in case uh, anyone wants to join, uh, you are most welcome. And I'll be adding the links later in the description. And in case you have any more question, we can still take those if uh, you are in, not in Harry, sir. I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> OK, cool. I think I think we are done, probably. So yeah, thanks thanks a lot for joining, uh, sir. And uh, it was really amazing session. I would, I, would love, actually, I would love to actually join one of the session. I am already in the Telegram group. So as soon as I get some time, I, I would sure. love to uh, be there. <laughs> yeah. And apart from that, uh, so we also give chance our uh, we ask our guests to actually promote something on the channel. So in case you want to promote something here, please do that. Uh, as I said, I'm semi-retired. I have no company to push. I have no uh, courses to sell. But uh, uh-huh. what I would like to say is switch to visual learning. You're wasting your time, really wasting your time. Uh, mm-hmm. You are young. You are uh, interested. You are very excited. And you're running into a wall where you're not understanding code. You're not understanding technical discussion. Mm -hmm. It changes like that the moment you start visualizing. I've been doing it for over 30 years. I have hundreds of thousands of students that I've trained. And uh, they are happy programmers because they understand things. So that's what I would like to promote, uh, not a product or a course. That, that's good. OK, uh, so Lars and Sarvesh says thank you. And uh, yep, so on closing notes, uh, we have our next session on next Thursday, actually, at 10, 10 p.m. IST. And the next guest is Lars. So we'll be talking about uh, doing Angular uh, testing in Angular. So there were a lot of interesting questions which we received from Twitter. And we are going to discuss those questions here next Friday, same time. Uh, sorry, next Thursday, same time. And uh, see you all. So uh, meanwhile, bye bye. And uh, 
uh, hope you enjoyed the today's uh, episode and we'll come back with more episodes and of course in few months i will i'll just ask sanjay sir to actually come again and uh, show some more visual uh, learning thing to us so yep yeah, thanks thanks well, again for joining my us. pleasure thank you everyone. thank you bye bye